Uh, let's start with Barbara Rose. Uh, in your speech, you gave us clues on how to get uh, children to eat vegetables, but obesity and weight control is a real problem all around the world. Why do we know so little about uh, eating behaviors related to childhood weight control? Yeah, the issue of childhood obesity has emerged in recent times. Uh, 20 years ago, a colleague of mine at Penn State was uh, doing a grant application for the National Institutes of Health, and it was on childhood obesity, and she was told it was not an issue um, just 20 years ago. So, in the meantime, and historically, our child feeding policies, of course, have been based on undernutrition. And we still, of course, need to consider undernutrition, but in the meantime, along with the adult um, obesity epidemic, the children have been getting more and more overweight and obese. And, of course, the statistics show that that's happening in Turkey as well. So obviously if it wasn't considered an issue, people were not studying this problem and they were not getting funding to study it. So now, and I make a call to all of you young investigators in the audience, we need um, emerging scientists to study these problems. And you could see from my talk that we're having to base policy on no data. We're just having to make policy on what we think makes sense. So ultimately, we, we need a new generation of scientists to be studying eating behavior and obesity-related issues in children. Um, so those of you who are young investigators in the audience, I plead to you, you are our future. I have to say the one good thing about obesity rates increasing in children is it has gotten the attention of policymakers. As, as adult obesity rates were rising, it was very difficult. Obesity is not a disease that people want to support. Politicians don't necessarily want to support obesity. But with the children getting heavier and obesity causing health problems in, in the children, policies now are becoming absolutely critical. So that's, that's, again, the future. And I think funding will be available for those of you in the audience who are, are young. So keep working on this. Evet, çocuklarda kilo problemi ile ilgili yapılması gerekenlere değindi Barbara Rolls. Gençlere seslendi, siz e, geleceksiniz diye konuştu. Şimdi Adam Drunowski ile devam edelim. E, sir, you uh, gave us information on the relationship uh, between eating healthy goods and money. Do we have to be rich uh, to have a healthy life? Uh, that's the uh, summary of it. Uh, you also mentioned a nutrient density in Uh, as we started uh, by talking about children, how can we apply your nutrient uh, density index to children? Can you give us some examples on that? All right, let me answer the first question. Um, do you have to be rich? No, you don't have to be rich, but it helps. <laughs> and if you're not rich, it helps to be resilient and do the best you can with the resources you've got. But for example, when we talk about cooking, it really is not just nutrition knowledge, it also takes skills. And I was actually shocked to hear that even the 70 or 80 years old in Europe couldn't cook. I thought they still could, but apparently not. So the issue of cooking and having those skills is extremely important. So now let's get back to the issue of nutrient density of foods. The nutrient density measure is just a metric. It's a way of calculating the ratio of nutrients in relation to calories. Some foods are energy dense and other foods are nutrient rich, and it's our job to figure out which are which and tell the consumer. So when it comes to children, there are some foods of interest to children. We did a study looking at nutrient density of vegetables served in American schools. And we had a list of 158 vegetables supplied to us by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. First of all, we found that based on national data, about 50 or 60 of those vegetables were never consumed by school children. Absolutely not. So Barbara's right, they were not consumed. 
And then we did a nutrient density profile of the remaining ones and found, for example, that potatoes and beans gave you most nutrients per penny because we were trying to calculate the nutrient value per penny, which was of great interest to the school food directors because they got the government instructions to make the lunch more nutritious with extra reimbursement of six cents per meal. So they were supposed to be serving more nutritious foods and salads, but they got six cents. So it was interesting to us to point to these foods and those foods and those foods as being the most effective ones in terms of cost and nutrition. Okay, continuing with uh, children's eating behaviors, let's continue with Monique Roth. Uh, you informed us on senior citizens' uh, eating behaviors, but today's children are the future's uh, senior citizens. Uh, how would you describe the relationship between nutrition and healthy aging? I think it's key to... To age well is, is to start early, and I think uh, yeah, the data I presented sort of showed that these eating habits that you develop early in life echo through your whole life. And um, there's also, if you go to even um, older groups or more infirm groups, people with dementia, you also see people referring back to the experience of, of early life. So the, these early life experiences are both physiologically but also socially and psychologically important in determining how people and, and whether people are going to be able to, to live um, long and, and, and well lives. So I, th I think it is key for on, on, on all levels really to do that. Okay, uh, and Barbara rolls again. Uh, what can be done to reach uh, family caregivers in order to improve children's diets? So we have to do something about this issue, but how will we reach these people? Yes, well, we live in an era of social media, so clearly um, that is a way that we can reach many people. Um, most people nowadays have mobile phones, so we can develop interactive apps. We can um, target moms. Um, television, obviously, is another way to spread messages. We have to really build a social movement through these kinds of programs so that it becomes the right thing to do, that parents and other caregivers know that they need to be feeding their children a healthy diet. And of course, school-based programs such as the um, one that the foundation is running throughout Turkey have a lot of potential. I do urge any um, interventions like that though, to collect data, which I understand is being done here, to try to figure out which of the strategies turn out to be the most effective. Because we really, again, have very little data on what consistently has been shown to work through the school system. But obviously, the children can teach their caregivers if we reach them and get them excited so they really are a vehicle of change so keep up the work of the foundation in the schools i would urge you to target younger children as well i mean you saw in three to five year olds we're already developing eating problems that we really have little knowledge of so the younger um, the better and keep up doing these kinds of um, interventions and trying to figure out what, what will work in the long run. Uh, Professor Drunowski, you also mentioned about the importance of education in your speech. So what should, we be, what should be done uh, to get this education? In terms of education, I think we need to have tools. Um, one tool is being aware of where the correct scientific information comes from because there's a great deal of disagreement, confusion, misperceptions of the correct information, and people don't know where to be educated. So I was actually very pleased to see that the Ulker Foundation listed as partners some of the very credible sources of nutrition information. And they are not necessarily for the general consumer, but they are for the health professional. So, for example, would list EFSA, the European Food Safety Authority in Parma was listed on the Ulker Foundation slide. Very appropriate, they've done wonderful reviews of low-calorie sweeteners, satiety, water intake, all the recommendations from EFSA are right there for all to see. 
and then European Food Information Council, UFIC, was listed, the International Information Council, IFIC, was listed, and also ILSI, the International Life Sciences Institute. And I think those are sources of education for health professionals. When it comes to reaching the general public, I'm kind of a big believer in social media, television, YouTube, and I think you've seen the videos and the ways of reaching children, caretakers, and so on, and I would encourage you to do more of that. But the public outreach has to be always based on sound science, and I think having those credible sources of information listed by the foundation was very important. Okay, Professor Ratz, uh, you highlighted the nutritional needs of senior citizens. Uh, which, which eating habits uh, should we adopt as children uh, to reduce the risk uh, of getting diseases at older ages? I, th I think, yeah, the habits uh, th that we're trying to encourage are the ones that we need um, for later life, and they are, they are both an understanding of the foods, but also an understanding of, of things like how to prepare food, so the skills associated with making sense of the food world. And the food world now is this world of lots of information that comes up to us through many channels. And I think we also need to better understand how people um, want to learn. And not all of us want to learn in the same way. If we want to learn how to cook, some of us like recipes, some of us want to follow recipes to the letter, other people like to experiment and do things. And so I think we need to tailor our, or yeah, allow people yeah, to find the routes that are best for them to, to, to learn to do the things that they need to do. And those are things that we haven't really systematically studied. Um, I have colleagues who are very interested in this idea of creativity. And the creative process is something that you, you can gain um, benefit from. And I'm curious whether yeah, the creative process of handling and doing things with foods, do you feel comfortable when someone gives you a potato to know what to do with it, or can you only think of one thing? And sort of broaden those skills that people have, how they comfortable they feel with handling food, I think will also open up and, and make them um, better understand but also with the social media to, to really understand how are people talking to each other now. Um, I have colleagues who, in, in projects we've been studying how people use social media. Um, there's the opportunity also now for, that the public has a much bigger voice. In the past, it was experts who did things. These days, it's a much broader community of people who speak. That can frustrate us sometimes as scientists, but we need to acknowledge that everyone has a right to speak, and it's how do we then, as a society, move and make people yeah, resilient in that information-dense community to pick out and understand what are the useful pieces of information to follow on. Okay, Barbara Rolls again. Uh, at what age should we start to improve children's eating behaviors in order to prevent weight problems? Okay, well, you can't start too early, I think is the latest belief. Now, we, we did not um, get a talk on the first thousand days, which we were hoping for. Unfortunately, um, our speaker was ill, but um, there's a, a lot of emphasis now in, um, in, in policy um, on studying earlier and earlier ages. There's evidence that um, prenatal uh, effects are important. The mother's diet during pregnancy um, is important. If a, if a mother eats a lot of vegetables when she's pregnant, for example, carrots, this is some studies of Julie Manella, the children like the carrots better. So again, emphasizing that you need to start as early as possible. And then we get into the weaning foods, and I know that's very different across cultures, but making sure that the weaning foods are um, ones that are going to foster later um, healthy eating habits. And then, of course, I've said I, th I think that the preschool years are obviously critical, that we need uh, more data there. When you move into the pre-adolescent years, we have almost no data on influences um, on eating behavior. Um, it's hard to study preteens and teenagers, so that's a big problem, but, but we need to um, get more information there to figure out how we can get the kids of those ages to eat better. 
And of course, the foundation is focusing on the 8 to 12 year olds, so there's an opportunity to collect some essential information in Turkey. So I say good, good uh, wishes for those studies because they're absolutely critical. But early is good. Okay, uh, maybe we can move on to another issue, like uh, we hear lots of ideas, there's lots of voice on how diets should be, especially in Turkey. What are your thoughts about the information pollution uh, that we see on the internet, on the television, uh, and other kinds of media? Ah, the question of what the diet should be, that's exactly what I'm asked. Every time I go someplace and I'm a professor of nutrition, people say, Doctor, what should I eat? And then I wish I had a television show like Dr. Oz. <laughs> but I don't. So I say, well, a balanced diet, vegetables and fruit, all the right advice, but at the same time, I recognize that people have got economic, social, financial constraints, and we need to do something about that. So the problem is this. To eat well, it takes knowledge, and it takes money, and it takes time. If you have two out of three, knowledge and money, knowledge and time, time and money, you can do fine. But if you're zero for three, no knowledge, no money, no time, then you have a problem. Because then you're really at the mercy of what's in a store that you can eat prepared now, this minute. And so it does take some education, and the education needs to have some skills attached to it, not just nutrition knowledge, but also skills. I think it's very important to have those skills. Um, and it's um, good to have um, some way of knowing what to buy, how to prepare it, what to cook, and so on. And one more thing. In the United States, everyone thinks that people who go out all the time to fast foods are lower income, minority groups, and this is why they're obese. Absolutely not. People in the United States who cook and eat at home are big families, lower income, lower education, Mexican-Americans. People who go out all the time are young, single professionals who never eat at home. People in their 20s and 30s who are single, they never eat at home. They are not obese. So we need to have access to the right data. So what to eat? It kind of depends on you, what your constraints are, and I think the slogan should be, eat a little bit better every day. You will not make a huge transition from one day to the next. A little bit better every day is probably good enough. Okay, continuing with the information pollution issue, is it the same uh, situation for older people? Uh, what do you think about that? I think there's some, there are differences and that things will change um, because I think the, yeah, the routes for information might be different. Um, the, the use of technology, the internet is different. It's not as heavily used by the older population, though that is growing. Um, and it's also information through um, channels of service provision. When people see health healthcare professionals, when people interact with stores, um, there are also other routes um, through which yeah, people get um, support. And I think there also, it's, this, it's, it's the same issues. Do people have the right advice? Um, when you're older, I think you have to deal with more ailments. So again, you're bombarded with information that are associated with those. And you might be given information to, to, you know, to go down routes and, and um, yeah, deal with some of those in, 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 in ways that um, are suggested to you. And I think the recognition that a lot of information transmission goes through family and friends, again, is to sort of, yeah, best understand what is the common understanding of the people on certain topics. And I think there the focus is where are people getting their information from? Where can they, if they have questions, get their information from? And how can we best ease the access that they can get the answers to the questions they have? So knowing what questions people have is very important. Uh, for the uh, nutrition for children, uh, how do we decide who to listen to? 
That's a, a good question. I mean, Adam has already talked about some reliable sources. There are a number of organizations that filter through the information. Obviously, the credentials of the uh, people who you're getting the information from, it's so easy to, to check now on who it is um, through all of the noise on the internet and whatnot, what makes sense. Unfortunately, the consuming public often wants what I think of as magic when it comes to diet solutions and nutritional options. They want to hear the easy stuff. They want to hear that they can just keep doing what they're doing, never get off their sofa, eat whatever they like, and they will magically stay the right weight and be healthy. So that is what the um, many of the voices out there now are playing to. And it's very hard to counter that with good, sound nutritional messages it's hard to make them interesting enough. So those of us who are in nutrition have to keep working on that to come up with a compelling voice with authority so that we can stop people hearing about the things we agree on. I mean, I think the dietary guidance in Turkey and the United States, Britain, are, are all very similar. You know, eat more fruits and vegetables, whole grains, um, fish, uh, legumes, etc. So, and, but the public doesn't hear this because the media tends to tell them about the places where we disagree. So it's, it's a tough job, but we need, obviously, to keep trying to get the sound messages out to the public. Okay, moving on uh, to the last question, which I'd like to uh, address to each and every one of you. Uh, what are the roles uh, to be played by families and societies? Uh, in affecting the cultural transformation uh, in nutrition, which was uh, an issue today. Uh, we know that learning begins in childhood, obviously. Can we hear some of your thoughts on the necessity of having a course on nutrition in our schools? Yes, I would say that is absolutely essential. What are we trying to do right now at the University of Washington? is not only have a set of courses on nutrition and food policy at the undergraduate level, but we're actually going to be giving students a cooking course starting next year. It's going to be physics and chemistry of food, but it really is a cooking course to make sure they know how to cook for health. So yes, I'm absolutely in favor of beginning nutrition education well below graduate level, at the undergraduate level or in school. I think it's going to be very advantageous for everybody. Uh, what about you? What do you think, uh, especially about the uh, transformation uh, of nutrition? I think yeah, food offers such an opportunity to talk and think about both science, but culture, all aspects of life. So I think it's something yeah, that can be themed through so much of education and that it isn't solely about nutrition as we nutritionists maybe sometimes narrowly think about food. And I think yeah, it offers yeah, a way to think about almost every subject that you study in school. So I, I think that's what's exciting about it. Um, and I think that get, gaining that better understanding of the importance of it hopefully will then in turn yeah, make that we have a society that really respects and realizes that food is a responsibility that we have as a society to do something about. Um, and yeah, that those, yeah, when we come into points that we make decisions, whether it's for our families or whether it's for big organizations, that we are trying to make the ones that are most you know, based on sound evidence, and evidence not just from the biological and physiological, but also from all the social sciences to best make, yeah, help make helpful decisions. But I think we also need to understand science isn't the only thing that goes into decision making. And I think that's something also we sometimes forget as scientists, it's but one voice in that process of making policy and uh, how to make it most powerful a voice is about being transparent about the quality of the science um, that we're doing. And I think also that in education to teach people to, to understand why it's good to do good science, how you do good science, what are the characteristics of that, again, will make hopefully that people will utilize that much better. Okay, Professor Rolls, what do you think? Should we teach children how to cook, how to eat uh, at schools? Absolutely. Um, when I was in school, we did a compulsory course called Home Economics. And in fact, most of the nutrition departments have grown from Home Economics, 
but with financial constraints and very tight academic schedules in schools, home economics has vanished. I think really to bring it back, probably the most important thing I learned in school was cooking skills, because that's what I, I use every day. All of the mathematics and the science that I learned has changed or it's gone out of my head, but the getting the fundamentals of food, nutrition, et cetera, is absolutely critical. So I think the earlier you can start, the better. They have um, a lot of programs now with gardens in preschools and, and cooking in elementary schools. So I, th I think, again, the earlier, the better, and making it fun. And then the kids can take it home and teach their parents some of the skills that they missed out when they were in school. Don't educate the moms and dads, educate Absolutely, the children first. Absolutely, because if we don't reach the parents, it's not going to do any good just to teach the kids. So the, but the kids are an excellent way to transmit information. Thank you very mm -hmm. much for your comments. Değerli misafirlerimiz, panelimizle beraber e, zirvemizin de sonuna gelmiş olduk. Çok değerli bilgilerle bu zirveyi noktalıyoruz. Umarım sizler de en az benim kadar keyif almışsınızdır. Çok teşekkür ediyoruz katılımınız için. Gelecek sene görüşmek dileğiyle.